So, um, <clears throat> just take a couple of minutes now to tell you a little bit about Business for Scotland, for those of you who don't know who we are. Business for Scotland is an all-party and non-party group of business owners who believe that independence will provide positive opportunities for business. It was set up as a member-owned cooperative and launched just a year ago, and it now has around 1,500 members and growing every day, and we have groups in Glasgow, Edinburgh, Aberdeen, Inverness, Perth and Dundee, and shortly to be in other places, I believe Forth Valley, Ayr and Inverclyde are just starting up. So there are just six months to go, but we can do a lot in six months. The website for Business for Scotland is very active and provides articles over a whole range of topics such as currency, the economic case, the euro, etc. And we're currently followed, I had a quick look today, on Twitter by 11,500 people. So that's not bad for, you know, from a standing start just a year ago. We think that the business community has an important role to play in helping shape Scotland. 99% of Scotland's businesses are in the SME sector and the biggest percentage of those are very small businesses. We're going to, to have one event a month, um, every month from now on, on the last Wednesday of the month. So please tell anybody that you know who is still maybe undecided or a definite no. We'd be delighted to see them along here and give them the facts to, to make up their minds and possibly sway them the other way. Um, so, as I say, if you could spread the word, that would be great. And I just want to finally emphasise that Business for Scotland is not funded by any political party, nor by the Yes campaign. But we do need people to sign up to the declaration, which is on the, the website. So if you go and have a look at the website, if you haven't already done so, uh, you'll find that there. And it would be good as well if you could think about becoming a stakeholder member, which for £100 means you've got a stake in Scotland's future as we go forward. And that will help us to, to carry on and spread the word. Um, so now we come to the main speaker for this evening. Ivan McKee is a director of Business for Scotland. He's worked in manufacturing for over 30 years, mostly for large corporate organisations, until around eight years ago when he launched his own manufacturing consultancy and turnaround company. His work's taken him across the globe, including periods working in Scandinavia and Eastern Europe, and he currently has manufacturing businesses in Scotland, England and Eastern Europe. And that global experience has shaped his perspective on independence and shown him just how dynamic, responsive and successful smaller countries can be when given the scope to focus on what's important for their economies and business. So, over to Ivan. <clears throat> Ivan the key, so I'm going to talk to you for the next half an hour or so, and then there's going to be some other discussion that you'll take you through later. Um, first thing I want to talk about is uh, my journey to yes, why I'm here. Um, as Anne said, I've been involved in business for about eight or nine years on my own now, and I've built uh, built that businesses up over that time, and I've got manufacturing businesses in Scotland. England and uh, in Eastern <coughs> Europe um, and a couple of years ago when the independence referendum became a live issue um, I thought it was worthwhile having a look at the, um, the facts round about it to understand a bit more to make up my mind um, and uh, what I did was had a look at it as if it was a business, if Scotland was a business would you want to invest in it, would you want to buy it, did it make sense? Um, so I did what I do when I look at businesses um, because I, I've, I've been involved in buying and selling businesses over the years um, which was to go and look at all the facts and the data, ignore all the, the spin um, and see what the, uh, the real situation was. Um, so I went and did that and what I found kind of surprised me because like many people i had been led to believe over the years that we were too, too small, too poor, unable to uh, stand on our own two feet, subsidised by the rest of the UK. Um, and but when you look at the data, it's, um, the facts are, are quite the opposite. Um, and then what happened as a consequence of that, I went to a Business for Scotland meeting about just over a year ago um, to learn a bit more. I sort of stuck my toe in the water and before long I was in swimming with the sharks and it's, uh, it's been great fun, so <laughs> believe it or not. So um, we'll go through some of the stuff, the process that I went through and a wee bit more with some other information and there'll be plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end of that. First thing I want to talk about is a wee bit about why um, independence as a concept appeals to business people, um, entrepreneurs, if you like. Um, 
and there's a number of themes there that I think are very relevant and just talk you through them. Um, first of all, it's about what works. So if you're in, in, in business, you, um, you look at the market and you see who's successful and you see how they've done what they've done and you try and learn from that. Um, and if you look at successful countries, and we'll, we'll do some data on that in a minute, but successful countries are typically small, independent European countries of five to ten million people. Um, they are the, the, the wealthiest and usually the, the happiest and most successful countries. So that model kind of works. Okay. Um, part of that having a smaller country is you've got shorter lines of communication, more responsive, more adaptive, quicker to react. And if you've worked in a big corporate organisation versus running your own business or working in a smaller company, you know exactly what I mean. Um, you can make your own decisions, get things done, and you don't need to wait for 47 layers of management above you to, to approve um, buying a paper clip. Um, and that is, again, part of the reason why smaller countries are more successful and part of the reason why the concept of making your own decisions appeals very much to, to business people. Self-determination, as I say, taking responsibility for your own actions. Um, you make mistakes, but your own mistakes, and then you'll figure out how to fix them and not make them again. Um, and again, that's something that business people understand when, they, when they're running their own businesses. The concept of a management buyout, and I've been involved in those from both sides, from selling companies on behalf of a corporation through to buying companies as part of a management team. Um, and um, a management buyout is by far the most successful um, type of corporate restructuring that goes on. Um, and the reason for that is kind of obvious because the people that know most about the business are the people that step up to the plate and take responsibility for making it, making it successful. Um, and that's why that works. And again, that's something that business people understand. So in short, it's really about the difference between dependence and independence. Um, and I think that kind of neatly summarises why the concepts of, uh, of an independent Scotland chime very much with, uh, with business people. So in terms of the economics of this, um, this is a, a rich country, um, there's no denying that. Um, we generate more tax per person than the UK average have done over um, the last 30 years and more. If you look at the data there, um, so you can see all of that. Um, that's the numbers going back over the last five years, um, and it shows um, Scotland's tax take per head and the UK tax take per head. Um, that includes everything, so it's income tax, corporation tax, VAT, a whole lot. Um, and if you look at that five year average, um, £1,200 on average over that time. Some years it's a bit more, in some years it's a lot more, um, depending on a number of different factors. But whatever way you look at it, Scotland generates more tax than the rest of the UK. Um, last year wasn't a one-off, the last five years wasn't a one-off. I've had some um, crazy debates with people on the, on the no side on TV where they say, well, you can look at whatever period you like and you just pick a period to suit you. Well, no, it doesn't matter what period you look at over the last 30 years, every single year, the dark line there is Scotland's tax take per head and the light line is the UK average tax take per head. So say some years it's a bit more, in other years it's uh, an embarrassing about more, but it's, uh, it's a country that generates more tax than, than the UK. Scotland's GDP is higher than the UK average. <coughs> um, GDP gro uh, gross domestic product is what uh, is generally used internationally to measure the success of, uh, of different countries and their wealth. Um, last year, 11 per cent higher. The year before, 18 per cent higher. And again, if you look back through the, through the years and through the decades, it's been the same story. Interestingly, when you take the, the North Sea oil completely out of the picture and absolutely just ignore it, um, Scotland's GDP per head is the same as the UK average. So the oil is very much the icing on the cake, it's a bonus. And the, the, the decision is what about, um, how, who do you want to manage that bonus? It's not going to last forever. Um, we're about halfway through in terms of revenue generation, um, um, barring any, 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 any big substantial fines that, that may come along. Um, in the, the Atlantic or the Clyde Basin, for example. Um, but as it stands, we're about halfway through, and the decision is who do you want to manage the second half of the Old Bonanza? Do you want Westminster to, to, to do what they've done with it in the last 40 years, or do you want to keep that money in Scotland to build up a future that goes on beyond, uh, beyond the next 40 years? Um, you got to look at spend as well, obviously, when you're looking at business as well as revenue. You might have a good revenue stream, but spend's important. Um, and the way this is measured is, uh, round about the, um, the, the, the deficit. Now, 
Um, every country in the Western world at the moment is running um, running a deficit, um, with the possible ex well, exception of Norway. Thanks very much, John. Um, it's running a deficit with the, um, the exception of Norway. Switzerland and Sweden, another two small European countries, are almost break even, but everybody else has got a deficit of one level or another. The important thing is to compare Scotland to the rest of the UK. And if you look back again over the last five years, current budget balance, which is the, um, the difference between spend and revenue, excluding capital spend, infrastructure spend, um, so uh, it's close to what you call P and L with the depreciation take now. Um, so if you look at that, Scotland ran a surplus in 2008-9, and then deficits. The UK running bigger deficits almost every year, and the average Scotland at 4.3 percent. The UK at 5.9 percent. Um, clearly pre-crash running surpluses. I think the UK's last surplus was actually back in 2001. But right through to those in five, six, seven, and eight, Scotland was running, running a surplus. Um, so yeah, so if you look at revenue and you look at spend and you look at them together, Scotland's position is stronger than the UK's. Um, if Scotland was independent, it would be the 14th richest country in the world. Um, the UK at number 18. Uh, last year the number were slightly higher up the league table, it's like a football table, a whole bunch of countries kind of bunched together, not far apart, and I'll show you the numbers in a minute. Um, so we kind of move up and down in that, uh, in that table, but whatever way you look at it, we're always higher up, several positions higher up than the UK average. Um, that's the top uh, country, that's 2011 numbers, um, OECD, which is the, the world's uh, industrialised countries, um, and that shows you their position of um, their GDP, which is a the measure of the richest countries. Um, the interesting thing about that is um, most of those countries as I said at the beginning, are small European countries. Um, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, etc. Um, Denmark, um, and the, um, a lot of those countries always have a lot less natural resources than Scotland, which, is, uh, which goes without saying. The only two countries that are on there that aren't um, in that category are the United States and Australia, and the only thing that they've got in common is they both used to be ruled by London until they became independent. <laughs> um, okay. This is a quote from um, Standard & Poor's ratings agency that came out in February of this year. Um, I've pulled a number of quotes into this from various places because it's important to see that this isn't just me talking, right? There's, 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 there's authoritative sources that, that, that back up um, the message we're, we're putting out here. Um, so Standard & Poor's did a kind of pre-report um, on the basis that if Scotland was to be independent, how would they rate it? Um, so the quote is, uh, a rich, relatively diverse economy, um, GDP at $47,000, so that's 2014. So you flick back, 47,000 would put as well up there, but obviously it's, it's three years later. So the reality is we're, we're about here, um, but very close to the, to the top uh, top countries there. $47,000, even excluding North Sea Oil um, and calculating per capita GDP just by looking at onshore income, Scotland would qualify for the highest economic assessment. So they're not worried about um, the concentration of oil in the economy, which is about 16% in Scotland, and Norway is closer to 30%, hasn't done them any harm. And uh, Standard & Poor's, if it's less than 20%, they don't even consider it a, a factor to look at at all. So as far as they're concerned, it's a diverse economy, lots of legs to stand on, and even without oil, it's still a strong economy. Um, Scotland generates a higher percentage of the UK revenue than the percentage of spend it receives. Okay? Um, so every year the numbers come out uh, that, that look at Scotland's economy in a kind of P&L scenario, profit and loss account. Um, and if you look at those percentages, what it says is um, the percentage of um, Scotland or the UK tax take that comes from Scotland is always higher than the percentage of spend that we receive. Okay? Um, and that comes back to the same thing about we're on a lower deficit in the UK in each of those years. Um, if you look back over the last five years, in fact, and you see if Scotland had received the same proportion back of spending that we generated in, in, in revenue, um, in other words, if we'd run the same level of deficit as the UK has, then we would have been £8.5 billion better off over that period. Um, 
and again that's the same pretty much every year we generate more um, in t percentage terms in tax revenue than we get back in spending. Um, now, the reality is that independent Scotland wouldn't have run its economy the same way as the UK has run the economy. We'd be running a lot more deficit for a start. Um, so we wouldn't have spent all of that on, or, uh, in Scotland, we would have used a lot of it to, to reduce the, the debt. Um, but that's the reality, those numbers are the reality of where we are and where we should have been. Um, another couple of quotes, again, just to, um, to back up what I'm saying. That's from the IFS report. Um, and now, the IFS Institute for Fiscal Studies put a number of report outs towards the end of last year, and the, um, a lot of things were picked out of that in the media, which is, as we know, largely, largely unionist in nature, um, to show how, how difficult things would be for Scotland. But if you actually look at what the IFS said about the facts of Scotland's economic case, Never mind what they said might happen in 50 years' time. When you're talking about the facts of where we are just now, um, they were very clear. Scotland's financial position was stronger than the UK, and it's a wealthy country um, relative to the rest of the UK. Um, and again, they talk about the deficit in that year, the year before last. Scotland's deficit was 5%, and the UK is almost, almost 8%. So the data is all there to, um, to back that up. Um, one of the things that comes up a lot is round about um, the No Campaign telling us that borrowing costs in an independent Scotland would be higher and as a consequence your mortgage would go up and um, Danny Alexander was peddling this line again just a couple of weeks ago and it comes up all the time. So when this first came up last year we went and had a look a couple of months ago, we went and had a look at the data to see if the UK enjoyed these wonderfully low borrowing costs. Um, in Scotland as an independent nation would have to pay a lot more. And what you find, and it's easy to find, if you Google for five minutes you'll find this stuff. It's on, uh, on Bloomberg, um, this set of data, but it's all over the place because it's, it's public information. This is what governments pay in interest rates to the money markets to borrow money. And obviously it varies depending on where the markets are, um, but it's an indication of the risk um, the market sees in lending to a particular country, how much debt that country is carrying, um, and how secure the markets think their money is. And this is the, the, the yield or the interest rate you would pay um, as a government to borrow on a 10 year basis, so you're borrowing the money on a 10 year period. And if you look at it, what it's saying, the UK is at 2.83%. Now there's a bunch of countries that are worse than that, um, Greece, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Ireland, no surprise there. Um, but the fascinating thing is Switzerland, okay, they're in a good shape. Um, Germany, yeah, it's good shape. But then you look at Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Austria, Sweden, and even France, Belgium, um, lower borrowing costs in the UK. In some cases, like Denmark, I mean, significantly lower. Okay. So this thing about an independent Scotland would pay more for its, its borrowing, frankly, is it just doesn't hold water, right? Because Scotland would start off by virtue of the fact that we've got a higher GDP um, as an independent country we would start off with a debt to GDP ratio, which is what they measure, even if we took a full population share of debt, which is open to debate for various reasons, but even if we took the maximum debt we could possibly be allocated, our debt to GDP ratio would be 10 to 20% better than the UK, so we start off on that measure with, uh, in all likelihood, lower borrowing costs. Um, okay, so we're going to move away from words and numbers. I've got some pictures to go through. Um, some graphics. Where does the UK's wealth come from and where does it end up? This is a map from um, Eurostat, um, European uh, Union numbers, um, and they look at different parts of the UK, different areas, um, and they look at the amount of wealth that's generated. It's back to this GDP per head, gross domestic product per head. So in simple terms, the, um, the darker the colour, the more wealth is generated um, in that part of the country. Now, as you would expect, the centre of London is, is right up there, running along the M4 corridor in the, uh, about in the south coast of England, the um, north west of England around the Manchester area, and the north east of Scotland, and to some extent across the central belt as well, um, are the areas <coughs> where the most wealth is, uh, is generated um, in the country. The next m map is where the wealth ends up. So this is a graphic that shows the wealthiest households in the UK. 
Um, now, it's, it's the households that have got close to a million pounds of wealth, so that includes everything, it's your savings, your house value, your whatever you own, your whatever, stocks and shares, pension, whatever. Um, so when you add all that up by household, um, more than 13% of the households in the, the southeast of England are in that category, and less than 7% in Scotland. Um, so it's um, kind of interesting. And that sort of answers the paradox that people have of if Scotland, looking at the numbers, is a rich country, why does it not feel like that when you walk about and look at stuff? Okay, Because that's where it comes from and that's where it ends up. Now, the next graph is, or the next map is um, a kind of social manifestation of that because money for money's sake is one thing. But of course, wealth in a society has got a direct impact on a lot of social aspects. This is a map of um, average male life expectancy um, by area of the UK. Um, the darker the colour, the lower the life expectancy. Okay, the very dark area is 78, 74, um, and then 74 to 78. Most of south of England, 78 to 82. There's three areas that are the highest point, 82 to 85, they're so small you can't see them on the map, um, no prizes, it's um, Chelsea, Kensington and Westminster. I live in Glasgow, but I'm going to move when I'm 69. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the point is obviously it's, um, it's a fairly dramatic indication of the social problems that a lack of retaining wealth causes for, causes for society. So to summarise that part of it, too poor, right, right. So, moving swiftly on, a couple of things I just want to talk, touch on. Um, one is the, um, the bank bailouts, because this comes up quite a lot. Um, Alistair Darling is terribly guilty of this. He knows better. I hope he knows better, because he was a chancellor. If you're in a bank and it goes bust, it's a problem. It's a problem for borrowers, for savers, for businesses. It's a problem for the government and the whole economy. That's why when banks go bust, unlike other types of businesses, governments step in and bail them out more often than not. Not always, um, but more often than not they do. Um, and the way governments do that is based on where the contagion is. So if the bank going bust is going to problem, cause a problem in a certain country, that country's got an incentive to get involved and do something about it. Where the nameplate of the bank sits in terms of its head office is, is completely irrelevant. <coughs> okay? um, now, there's a few examples that just kind of highlight that. If you look at the British banks, um, the US Fed, Federal Reserve, put in about a trillion dollars, 640 billion pounds, to the bailout of the UK banks. Barclays got the biggest number, 550 billion dollars. And H Boss and RBS also got numbers between 100 and 200 billion dollars. Now the reason they did that is because those banks all operate in the US. If they'd gone bust, it would have been a disaster for the US economy. Um, Barclays in particular <coughs> was highly tied up with the whole Lehman Brothers situation. Um, so there was a requirement to, to square them away as part of that. Um, another example uh, in Europe. A couple of Belgian banks, Dexia and Fortis, were involved, um, like RBS was, in the ABM Ambro situation. Now those banks, their nameplate the head office is in Belgium, but because they operated across a number of countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, France and the Netherlands all got involved to, to, to bail them out. Um, less than 10% of RBS's employees are in Scotland. 80% of their business is a trading desk in the city of London. RBS also owns Nat West. H Boss is Halifax Bank of Scotland. They'll be saying that the Halifax City Council had to bail them out, right? It's um, they are uh, largely ran out of Halifax despite the, um, the, the head office scenario. So when you look at all of this, the reality is that an independent Scotland would have worked with our, other countries. And the Bank of Australia were also involved in this, as was the, the Qatari Bank who had uh, some tie up with the UK banks. So Scotland as an independent country would probably have put in about 10% of the bailout fund as um, they, they did effectively um, by putting in our share of the, um, of the, um, the, 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 the uh, uh, share of the UK tax um, that we did um, in, in effect anyway. And also if you look at what the UK government did with the banks in Ireland, they don't need to get involved in bailing out the Irish banks, but again, they did it because they did business in the UK and they'd gone bust with problems for the, for the British economy. So, um, Alistair Darley's not always 
as honest as he might be. Now, why went? Why might that be? Why might it be that um, we get people standing up um, on television, um, etc., telling us um, an independent Scotland would be a disaster? Um, now we're talking about employment as one of the themes for tonight. There's only going to be 59 redundancies when um, when we have a, an independent Scotland, and it's going to be. 59 Westminster MPs um, <laughs> because uh, they lose their jobs, they lose their career path that they've worked climbing up the greasy pole of the political parties um, all their life to get to. They lose the opportunity of getting a, a seat in the House of Lords if they uh, play their cards right. So for them it's, it's a fairly serious fairly serious issue, okay? Um, and that's why they're so absolutely um, active in trying to um, campaign against independence. Um, and there's a nice wee quote, um, which is very appropriate. It's hard to get somebody to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Okay. Um, you, can, you can understand, so I don't blame them. Um, okay. So this is a quote, I'm going to talk a wee bit about industrial policy. My background is in manufacturing. Um, it's something I've been involved in since um, I studied engineering and business back in the, the early 80s. Um, this is a quote from the 1979 referendum in the Daily Express editorial. Um, I can just about remember it. Some folk will remember it. Other people think, what is this guy talking about? <laughs> um, but obviously in 1979 there was a, a referendum set in the Scottish Assembly. Um, and the Daily Express, like many other papers then, as now, was opposed to any constitutional progress in Scotland. And they ran this uh, editorial with this great quote in it. And if you look through, of course, oh, I forgot to highlight Linwood as well, um, the, uh, the industrial base in Scotland had at that time was largely wiped out, not as a consequence of us voting yes and setting up an assembly in 1979 but quite the opposite by virtue of a strain. Part of the United Kingdom and the tremendous oil money that flowed in the early 80s has not been put to, to use where it should have been put to use. Um, so yeah, I mean there's a quote there, um, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. So if, uh, it's not as if we haven't seen this happen before. Um, and interestingly, if you see what's going on now, both Standard Life and Scottish Widows, um, we're on record in the 1990s quoted as saying that if a Scottish Parliament was set up, they would leave Scotland. Um, so, uh, frankly, once you've done it twice, and done it three, twi once, twice, the third time, people are going to get the right to treat your comments with a bit of scepticism. That's a chart of um, a bunch of different European countries and how much their, their, of their GDP is in manufacturing back to 1970 up to 2010. So without even looking at that, there's no prizes for guessing which one is the UK. Um, now all Western countries of, of their manufacturing base has shrunk and that's been part of globalisation, it's been part of the rise of China, India, Latin America and that's to be expected um, as wealth gets shared more around the world um, and these countries come up the ladder. Um, but as you can see, um, most countries have managed significantly better than the UK to support the manufacturing sectors through that process. And they do it through a variety of ways. I mean, they've all got common ways of doing it. Germany's got their own strategy. There's a bit of an industrial powerhouse. The, 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 the flagship brands that they've protected and all the middle range of manufacturing companies have got to support that. I've, uh, I spent a year working in Finland, up in the north of Finland, and a small town of 5,000 people with two reasonably large manufacturing companies each support more than 200 jobs in the town. But not only that, these are global companies that also had factories in Eastern Europe and in Asia, um, but headquartered in a small town in the north of Finland. And the next town, 20 miles down the road, had another one. And that was all in the sheet metal fabrication sector. Um, and the reason that's there in the middle of nowhere in Finland is because the government takes an active um, policy to spread the industry around the country and support clusters of manufacturing where it makes sense. Um, because they don't have um, a a fascination and a fixation with a financial sector centred in the city of London, which is the be all and end all of the economy. So that's a very graphic example of, uh, of the reality of the lack of manufacturing industrial policy over the last 30 years. Um, a couple of quotes that I've got up here, which are from a paper that came out just this week, and the reason they're kind of pertinent is because 
Gordon Brown actually spoke at the launch of this paper, which was all about manufacturing or industrialisation strategy and the options for uh, the UK going forward. But um, it's kind of ironic because he did it as part of our let's get out the Tory government for how they destroyed things. But A, it goes much, much, much further back than that, right through the last two pages of Labour governments. But also, um, some choice quotes in there about the impact that, that London has on the UK's economy. Um, the Westminster government's priority is too often to spend money in and around around London, very little infrastructure spent in, in, in Scotland um, under the Union. Um, and talking about the high-speed rail line, um, now there was a study came out a few months ago that actually said this part of Scotland, the north-east of Scotland, Dundee and Aberdeen would actually be worse off as a consequence of the high-speed rail line because what it would do, it would concentrate more economic activity and wealth and the areas that, that benefited from it, London up through the Midlands and, and, and suck more investment and activity away from here than the, the parts of the UK furthest away from it. Um, and another quote from Vince Cable, London is sucking the life out of the rest of the country. Now, having a large world city on your doorstep isn't necessarily a problem. It can be a good thing if you deal with it right, but you need to be able to manage your own economy to take advantage of that and not be in a position where you're dictated to um, and uh, the gravitational pull is such that you get too close and get sucked into, in, into that. Um, a couple of things about um, some numbers around about the opportunity for Scotland. Um, this is connectivity, so it looks at um, when dug out, again you can, you can google this stuff, it takes 10 minutes to find it, um, because we can add a wee look at airports and connectivity, air passenger duty, independent countries and how much economic activity we've got. So you look at Norway and you look at Denmark, so two countries similar size to Scotland, um, and you look at how many passengers go through their main airports. Um, now obviously they've got, like Scotland, a range of airports, as a matter of fact I think both of those countries have probably got more airports than we have in Scotland. But if you look at Copenhagen and you look at Oslo on their own, um, the main airports there, um, and how many passengers they get in a year, and you look at Edinburgh, and it's tiny, and you look at Glasgow and Edinburgh together, to give maybe a fairer comparison, it's still a long, long way away from the amount of traffic they've got. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is air passenger duty, which is obviously higher here than it is in, in most countries. The reason for that being that um, the UK <coughs> government won't let us change that rate because mm -hmm. that would then allow us to compete with Heathrow, which would be a problem for the London Centric view. Um, and also, if they reduced it across the UK, it would reduce our tax take from Heathrow, which is a big, big issue for them. So we're kind of hamstrung there and, and not been allowed to, to, to do that under devolution. Um, but of course, the other issue is if you're an independent country and you've got um, activity in your country, be it embassies, be it head offices, be it UN or international agencies, be it whatever, if you've got a country, people come and do business with you by virtue of the fact you've got a country in a capital city there, if you're a regional backwater of a bigger country, then that activity just doesn't, um, doesn't happen and you can see that all over the world. That's um, a report from Ernst and Young about inward investment and the interesting parts uh, they, they do this every year. Um, last year, um, like the year before, Scotland got most inward investment in the UK, um, apart from London. Um, and uh, the quote there is, inward investment to Scotland has not been deterred by the prospect of the referendum. Um, in fact, quite the opposite. So all the scare stories about a two-year referendum campaign is going to create uncertainty and destroy inward investment. Complete nonsense. Um, inward investment in Scotland is still rising. Um, and part of that, to be fair, um, you think, well, why would people do that? If you look in business or you look at people that manage money and manage investment, what they look for is a business that has um, got the right uh, fundamentals in place, it's wealthy, it's got a diverse um, business arrangements that deals in a lot of different sectors, um, and, and all those sectors are strong, um, but it's also badly managed, and that's where people that are not smart invest their money because they're looking for a turnaround in that. And if you're a hedge fund investor, whatever that's what you do, you change the management and then drive the benefit from that business. So people looking at Scotland in that sense see exactly that. They see a, a country that's got a lot of strong fundamentals, a good economy, but it's been badly managed with the wrong strategy. And it's a um, huge opportunity to, um, to make that much stronger uh, quite, quite quickly.
Some charts of recently independent countries and the increase in inward investment that they had. Um, now, some of those are very dramatic, they're, they're, they're mainly ex-Eastern Bloc countries, so there's a number of reasons for that, but what it does show is that um, you're an independent country in general, you get a lift in inward investment. Um, and that's for all the, all the reasons I've talked about, talked about before, you have more activity going on in your country. Um, and more people coming to, to do business with you, and you've got a higher brand profile as well, which is which is important. Um, so uh, the, 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 the next thing is um, just I, mean, I wrote some stuff on this a business of Scotland uh, last year, based on my experience in, in manufacturing, and the theme tonight is about how you generate jobs. Um, so there's half a dozen kind of key pointers there about things that you would do if you were looking at Scotland or reindustrialisation policy for Scotland. Um, higher added value is important. Um, the reason that the, the German economy is strong isn't because they go head to head with China, because they know they can't win that mass producing rubber ducks or, or whatever it happens to be. Um, the people that can mass produce stuff cheaply are the people that do that. You focus on getting up the value chain producing the higher value, higher technology stuff, and the Scandinavian countries are exactly the same. Um, and you're always looking for the next level of technology to get there ahead of the competition. So as you, you've got higher paid jobs effectively, um, supporting that technology. Um, supporting small businesses in particular, and making them grow, and also a much fairer tax system. The reality is, uh, and I've become a victim of that as much as anybody, when your business is successful, you end up spending more and more of your time talking to your tax advisors than focusing on your business strategy because the UK's tax code is so complicated uh, you, uh, you end up just going through all that stuff trying to figure out what should be where and how you're going to arrange all your, your business to, to try and manage the tax situation. Um, after the US, I think we've got the second most complicated tax code in the world. Part of the reason for that is the people that write the tax code, the people that advise the government on writing the tax code, are the PWCs and the Deloitte's and the Ernst Young people. They're kind of in a revolving door. They spend a couple of years working as advisors to the government, making a complicated tax code. Then they go back to where they came from um, and sell their services out at thousands of pounds a day to advise people on how to, how to avoid tax. So they've created a huge monster, which is an absolute nightmare. Um, identify sectors you can be successful in. Um, and again, that's about what technologies make sense. I mean, Scotland's got huge advantages. You've got, there's an oil sector, an offshore sector that isn't going anywhere, and a lot of the manufacturing technology on the back of that. There's a renewable sector that's growing, and we need to be better at leveraging on that. Um, and then there's, there's food and drink, obviously, which is something that we're, we're very strong in. So it's all about identifying those sectors and building on them. Um, the education system is critical, um, aligning that, um, training the right graduates, the right technical graduates largely, to support what you're trying to do in industry. Learn from the best in the world. You go and look at small countries and see what, see what they do in Finland, see what they do in Sweden, see how it works, see what they do in Denmark um, and, uh, and, and copy that and, and do what they do take the best and build in brand strengths. I mean, Brand Scotland is, is, is big and should, should be a lot bigger globally. Um, and if you look at our food and drink exports, a lot of it, whiskey, um, fisheries, etc., a lot of it's built on that premium brand. And that goes back to the, if you've got a premium brand, you can charge a lot more for it and support higher paid jobs in those sectors. Scotland's strengths and how we don't always recognise recognise what those are. And it's about the Prime Minister in Norway that went for a walk along the, the fjord one day and he found the magic lamp. So he picks up and gives it a rub and the, the genie pops out and um, and the genie says to him, I'll give you some wishes to make Norway a better place. And the Prime Minister says, well, that's tough, you know, we're, we're just about the richest country in the world. We're, by any measure, we're about the happiest country in the world. We've got, we don't really have poverty. Most people have got a reasonable standard of living. We, we've all got plenty of leisure time to go and do what they want. And we, we do all kinds of stuff. And it's, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Um, he says, well, there must be something. He says, well, let me think about it. He said, I've got a few. He said, um, we've got a, a, a good industry, but it's very narrow. It's based on oil, fisheries, a wee bit of hydro, but, but that's pretty much it. It'd be good to have more legs to an industrial base. He said, um, we've got this drink called Aquavit that nobody's ever heard of. Um, it'd be great if that was a, a world brand. If everybody knew what it was, if people all over the world from Shanghai to Singapore would pay 
um, to Chicago would pay stupid money to take it off our hands and, um, and we couldn't make enough of this stuff and we were the only people that could make it. She says, oh yeah, we can do that for you. He said, um, we've got a real problem with our, um, our language. We speak Norwegian. Nobody else in the world speaks Norwegian. It'd be great if, if we want to go and do business anywhere. We've got to learn another language. If we want to go on holiday, we've got to learn another language. It'd be great if Norwegian was a world business language and anywhere we went, go to Japan or go to Brazil, do business, you could just speak Norwegian and everybody understood you. Um, yeah, we, we can manage that. He said, um, we've got um, a problem, we've got a beautiful country here, but it's, it's huge um, and the weather's awful. It takes forever. If you want to build a road in Norway, you've got to knock a mountain down. I mean, it's an incredible place. And that's what they do, they knock mountains down to build roads and railways. Um, and uh, the weather's horrible. Four months of the year, it's minus 30 and we've got the snow plows out. Um, it'd be great if we had the same amount of natural resources in a country a quarter the size, but um, a nice temperate climate all the year round, not too hot, not too cold. He said, yeah, we can, uh, we, can, we can manage that. He said, um, if we want to get to our main markets, we've got to go through two other countries to get there, which is a real nuisance. It'd be great if we had a, um, a landmass with 60 million people on it, just on our southern border, and they wanted to buy our drink and our energy, and they all spoke Norwegian so we could communicate with them. Um, a great market opportunity for us, that'd be, that'd be super. He says, yeah, we can, uh, we can do that. He said, um, it'd be great if we had uh, an industrial heritage going back 150 years, and everybody in the world, your inventors and all the great things they'd invented, and our engineers are held in, in high respect. Um, it'd be great if we had a diaspora of millions, of, tens of millions of people and all the world's key economies that wanted, to, wanted us to do well and had an affinity with us. Um, it'd be great if we had a national brand that was much stronger and people recognised our national dress instantly and our national poet and, uh, from Russia to America every year they would celebrate them um, and, and, and pay homage to, to, to us and, and, and recognise our national brand as part of that. He said, yeah, yeah, we can manage all of that. And the whole point is that when you go through what Norway's got is this aspiration um, I mean, and, and people on the north side laugh at us when we talk about we could be one day as rich as Norway. But when you look at it, you think, well, Norway should really be our starting point, and we should be saying how much better than that can we be, um, not something that's, that's a mere aspiration. Um, there was an article in the Independent newspaper um, a few weeks back, a guy called Dominic Frisk, I think his name is, and he'd written, um, he looked at this stuff and he said, well, if you look at the most successful countries in the world, there's three factors that... Um, that influence that, they've all got one or two of, th of these factors. And the three factors are they're either small countries of five million people that are responsive and fast, maybe not a lot of natural resources, but they get things done, like Finland, like Denmark, um, or they've got that kind of population profile and a strong heritage in financial services, like Switzerland, like Singapore, um, or they've got that kind of population profile and a lot of natural resources, like Norway. Uh, it says at the moment there aren't any countries in the world that have got all three of those. And success factor, Scotland would be the only one. And the headline was, was Scotland could be the richest country in the world. So I, the, the bottom line is, if you look at this, um, in business for Scotland, we talk about um, independence being the business opportunity of a lifetime. And I think that's true. Um, and you don't like to count chickens, but if you look at this, from where we are positioned and you started off with a blank bit of paper and you wrote down all the things you'd want an independent country to be, you'd be pretty much struggling to find anything that we haven't already got, and be it location, size, language, natural resources, history, talent, whatever, it's all there. Um, so it's really up to us to, to take the opportunity and make the most of it. So thanks very much. <laughs> very much Ivan, that was very enlightening. I was just wishing that my friend who's an accountant who keeps asking me, but where's the balance sheet? I wish she was here tonight and she's not. So I'll be able to tell her the figures now, I hope. Well, I've but, got it on video, so... Right, yeah. I'll send it to her, yeah. <laughs> so there's a couple of things struck me, um, just uh, as Ivan was going through his talk, just about being independent-minded. And I don't know if anyone follows Leslie Ruddick, who's, you know, I think a great journalist and broadcaster and has written a fantastic book, um, which I would commend to you. I'm not on commission but I just think it's a really good book which is called Blossom Scotland's you know what Scotland needs for independence and I do think it's about being independent minded and about being grasping the opportunities that Ivan's just talked about and I was thinking back to my own just a, a wee analogy thinking back to my own situation um, I worked for the public sector then left and went to NCR 
to get more money, filthy liquor, and I thought that would be a great job. And it was a great job in some ways because I saw a lot of the world, but I was still an employee. So luckily for me, NCR were looking for uh, people to take redundancy. So I took my redundancy and set up in business on my own, and that was in um, 2002. Um, and I've had some very tough times in the past year, um, and, but I'm still here, I'm still on my own, I'm still glad I did that. But if I'd stayed where I was, which is what I get a lot from people who are saying they're going to vote no, but we're better to stick where we are, well, I'm sorry, I don't think we are. I think all the things that we've heard tonight mean that we're better to grasp the opportunity and move on. If we'd stuck where we were, some of the things that, that I can think about that we would still be smoking in pubs, we would still be drinking and driving, you know, not wearing the seat belts. we would still not have a Scottish Parliament. So for all these reasons, I think we're just at the right time to grasp an opportunity. I think Scotland has all these things going for it and I can't see why we wouldn't do it. So that was just a wee aside. But now we're going to have a, a bit of a debate and it's a bit of a different style of, of debate. So I'm going to hand over to Joe Lafferty to explain just a wee bit about it.